Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 15th of January and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 18th of January with me Michael Hewson. First and foremost, um, a happy new year to you all, albeit somewhat belated given the fact that I decided to take some extended time off over the Christmas and New Year break. Pretty much hit the ground running, um, get, rid of, get rid of the uh, risk warnings and what have you. Um, markets have pretty much hit the ground running straight out of the traps at the beginning of the year, um, posting some fairly decent gains in the first week of trading. Second week of 2021 has been slightly more subdued. Um, nonetheless, um, equity markets still remain fairly resilient. If we look at the FTSE 100, we've um, managed to consolidate significantly above this 6,600 level, which were the peaks that we saw at the beginning of December. Um, I think the likelihood of further gains still remains fairly high. I'm still fairly bullish on the FTSE 100 heading into 2021. We might see a little bit of consolidation over the course of the next few weeks, but nonetheless, I think despite the, the, the worsening outlook that we've seen in the first two weeks with respect to infections uh, and um, obviously record death rates, not only here in the UK, but also in France, Germany and the United States. The vaccination program is continuing apace. And I think that more than anything, while we may see a delayed recovery, I still think the prospect of a recovery is very much on the table, though it's probably not now going to happen uh, much before um, the second quarter or even the third quarter of this year. Um, I think really as we look ahead to the second quarter, it's really about how quickly restrictions can be loosened. And at the moment, they're still being tightened in France. They've just implemented a 6 p.m. curfew. And in Germany, they're talking about the prospect of extending the restrictions um, to April. And this, just just to remind you that this will be Angela Merkel's um, last year or last few months as German Chancellor because she is stepping down and the race to succeed her is already starting to get underway in Germany for the German elections in September and October. We've also got the Dutch elections due in March. Um, there's a distinct possibility that um, we could get a new Dutch government and the Italian government is once again struggling to stay afloat. So political dysfunction in Europe is slowing down the European response. And I think that could well also be positive for the pound more broadly. Um, and, and I'll come to that in a minute. But, um, you know, as, as we look ahead towards the rest of this month, the outlook still looks fairly positive for stocks. Yes, we have seen a little bit of a pullback in these daily candles here, which might suggest that we could well be constrained at 6,900 and may, may continue to trade between 6,600 and the current levels over the course of the short to medium term. I would be concerned more broadly, I think, if we fall below um, this particular trend line that I'm about to draw in here. If we fall, if we fall below if we fall below this particular trend line through here and the 50 day moving average, then I would be a little bit concerned about the direction, the overall um, upward momentum that we've been in over the course of the past few months. But it, with central banks remaining very much on the front foot when it comes to monetary policy and um, governments still remaining um, fairly accommodative when it comes to fiscal measures, I'm broadly optimistic that we shouldn't see significant downside in stock markets in the short to medium term. Same applies to the DAX here. Same sort of story. We've broken above these previous peaks through here around about 13,400. So we could see dips back towards that. But overall, this, this, this candle here is in particular is bearish. It's a key reversal day, which is a little bit of a worry. But as we can see in previous instances where we've seen sharp downward thrusts, we haven't really followed through towards the downside. And as such, I would still expect to see fairly positive momentum maintained here. It's much more prevalent, I think, if you look at something like the S&P 500. 
which once again has made new fresh record highs over the course of the past few days. One word of warning I would give you, ladies and gentlemen, is that the tech sector, particularly social media stocks, could well be vulnerable to sharp downward corrections. I think there is a case to make to, to say that US stocks are overvalued, very much so. Um, and with that in mind, I would caution um, being um, looking to get aggressively exposed to the likes of Facebook, Twitter, um, um, Alphabet, for example, obviously they own YouTube. Um, there's going to be a crackdown on the big tech companies, some more than others, I think, and the new Biden administration um, is likely to be much um, less sympathetic, shall we say, to the lobbying of US big tech than their predecessors, who some of which are equally as antagonistic towards the tech sector. So that sort of brings me neatly on to what we're going to be looking ahead to this week, because we've got a big week. We've got a big week for macro, probably more than micro. Um, we start off the week on Monday with Chinese fourth quarter GDP, retail sales and industrial production. So let's talk a little bit about that, because certainly I think in terms of the economic recovery, the global economic recovery, China has really been blazing a trail when it comes to the economic recovery there. The lack of a second wave is certainly helping the economy recover. We saw from the trade data um, in the early part of this month that imports and exports are racing ahead. Another record surplus for the Chinese economy. PMIs have been broadly decent. And as such, um, we've got Chinese retail sales and industrial production for December as well. So we'll start with the retail sales. I mean, the fourth quarter GDP, I think, is neither here nor there. I think I've always been highly suspicious of the Q4 GDP numbers or any GDP numbers coming out of China because I think they're massaged to death. That being said, um, I think the prospect of a, you know, a, a 6.2 um, expansion is going to be broadly in line with what markets were expecting. With respect to retail sales, that turned positive in August last year, and is, since then it's continued to improve month on month. Lack of certain, the lack of a second wave has certainly helped, and I think if that's sustained, and while demand still remains below the levels we saw at the end of 2019, there is scope for further rebounds. We've seen three consecutive months again since September. The December numbers are expected to continue that trend with a rise of 5.5% up from the 5% gain that we saw in November. Um, as I say, I mean, the lack of a second wave appears to be prompting the Chinese consumers to slowly reopen their um, purse strings. And as I think that as such, the, the performance of the Chinese economy should continue um, to do well um, as we head into the first quarter of this year. So I'm not really expecting any negative surprises from the Chinese economic data that's due out on Monday. The other key event for the week is the presidential inauguration of President-elect Biden on the 20th of January. Um, given recent events on Capitol Hill, I think the inauguration is going to be a fairly low-key affair when it comes to crowds. Yes, there's going to be a number of high-profile celebrity names at it, namely Tom Hanks, Lady Gaga, Jennifer Lopez. Um, but all in all, I think much more away from the so-called pizzazz, shall we say, of how many A-listers and B-listers the Democrats can pull. It's really all about what sort of tone Pre President-elect Biden sets in contrast to four years ago when President Trump. Um, its inauguration, I think, was most memorable for the fairly divisive nature of the speech that he gave. Um, it was it was very it was a very belligerent tone. So this week's speech is unlikely to be as divisive. I think it will give a decent indication. We've already got a decent indication of what the Democrats intend to do when he outlined a new fiscal aid program of one point nine trillion dollars 
in a variety of areas, specifically in the form of $350 billion in state aid, an increase in the minimum wage, and a further $1,400 in stimulus payments to US workers. Now, there was little in the way of detail about future longer term spending commitments on infrastructure and other types of investment, including education, energy, and green investment. I think that's likely to come once he's got his feet under the desk of the Oval Office, but he could give some fairly decent steers on policy at his speech later this coming week. And I think that more than anything is what I'll be looking to take away from the presidential inauguration. So away from that, we've also got an ECB rate meeting, which is due on Thursday the 21st. We've got flash PMIs for January for the 22nd. We've got also UK retail sales and UK public finances, as well as the latest inflation data, as well as a number of key earnings announcements, which you can see in my week ahead table down here, namely Burberry, Netflix and Goldman Sachs. So let's, um, let's move on to the ECB. Um, now, it's been no secret that the ECB has been uncomfortable with the direction of the euro since we broke above this 12070 area in the middle part of December. Um, now we've seen a little bit of a pullback. We haven't as we've we've met my my interim target on my um my triangle breakout here of 12235 and we've overshot and gone all the way back towards um 123 and a half. Now I still maintain that we can probably revisit the highs that we saw in 2018 of around about 125, but I'm going slightly lukewarm on that in the short to medium term, simply on the basis that the vaccination program in Europe is not going well. They're lagging significantly behind um, the rest of the rest of the world, particularly the UK and the US. Um, political instability in Italy. In, in not um, also in Holland, the likelihood of a new government there. You've also got Germany is going to probably start looking inward as well when they look to try and replace Angela Merkel as German Chancellor um, ahead of elections later this year. That would suggest to me that in terms of a fiscal response, you're going to see a very fragmented approach from EU leaders, and I think that is likely to hold the European economy back. Nonetheless. We still have the Pandemic Recovery Fund that has been signed off. How that money is divvied up um, is certainly going to make for an interesting, um, it's going to make for an interesting look going forward, but it's not really going to be enough, I think, to really put a floor under the European economy and drive a significant rebound in GDP growth and economic activity. And I think that's the big concern at the moment. The ECB is going to have to remain very, very accommodative and try and, in terms of its forward guidance, to try and talk the euro lower. Now, by and large, it's managed to succeed. We have come back down from these levels here. We posted a bearish reversal here, but we're going to find a fairly key support level around about 12070. And how the euro reacts there will determine where we go to next. Certainly on the basis of the slow stochastic and the RSI. Um, there is decent support at around about 12070. There also there is also the dollar side of the equation. You know, in essence, really, it's about the Federal Reserve inflation expectations. Will the Fed be concerned about rising inflation expectations? Will the market start to price in um, firmer bond yields and a stronger dollar? And will that help to drive the euro lower? That is the push pull at the moment on euro dollar. It's U.S. yields which has spiked well above that 1% level on the 10-year, um, which is obviously giving the dollar a much better bid against the likes of other currencies, or will it be economic events with respect to what's going on in Europe? Ultimately, I think the US economy is going to rebound much more strongly. That should favour the dollar against the euro, which means that even if we do get a move back towards 124 or 125, I really struggle to see euro much above that sort of level, which would suggest to me that we're probably going to see something in the region of 125 to 118 for euro dollar 
over the course of the rest of the year. So um, look at, looking at the ECB, Madame Lagarde has already suggested that the projections that the ECB put out in December, um, she's sticking by them. I think that's optimistic given the fact that Germany is already looking at extending restrictions into April and France has implemented a 6 p.m. curfew as of, um, as of this week, which means that any rebound in economic activity is likely to be delayed that much further. We've also got flash PMIs for January from France and Germany. They were pretty poor in December. I don't expect them to improve that much in January either, even though on the manufacturing side, they were fairly strong. And I think that is one uh, silver lining when it comes to the European economy. On the manufacturing sector, they've managed to ride out the worst of the downside of the these latest restrictions and lockdowns. But obviously services is likely to continue to be a drag going forward. So that's, um, that's Euro dollar. Um, we're looking at Euro sterling as well because there's likely to be a bit of push pull on Euro sterling as we look ahead to the coming week. We've got a host of UK data coming out. Um, we've already seen some fairly disappointing GDP numbers and um, industrial production and what have you, but they weren't actually as bad as I think most people had been pricing in. Now, obviously, Brexit finally has been resolved, so hopefully that's going to be one of the last times I mention the B word. That being said, towards the end of this week, we've got a host of um, data coming out, including obviously flash PMIs for manufacturing and services. More importantly, we've got UK retail sales for December. Um, now, Euro sterling, big, big level, 88.60. Um, we're once again retesting that level, once again finding decent support at that level. If we break below 88.60, then I think there's a very good chance we could well retest the lows that we saw in the beginning of May uh, last year, um, end of April, beginning of May. Um, I think with respect to the retail sales numbers and the public finances numbers, which are likely to be ugly once again, I think there's been an awful lot of um, chit chat about how much the UK government is borrowing um, and is likely to borrow over the course of this fiscal year. Personally, I think it's an awful lot of fuss about not very much because it's not as if the UK is in a different boat than every other economy in the world. The US is borrowing at record levels, so is France, so is Germany. So we're all in the same very leaky boat. Um, so really it's a question of how quickly do markets think that the various economies are going to recover? Given that the UK's vaccination program is still on course and ahead of pretty much everybody else's, that would presuppose that we'll get a faster economic rebound when we get an economic reopening sometime towards the uh, beginning to end of Q2. Um, so we're sort of looking April, May, June, when restrictions slowly start to get eased and we start to get some element of normalization. And I use the phrase normalization in the loosest possible term. Um, in November, in terms of public finances, the government borrowed £30.8 billion. Pounds. Now, that brings the total amount for this fiscal year to £245 billion. Pounds. It's a post-war record. Um, the very real prospect, the total this year could rise to over £300 billion pounds by year end. We're expecting another £32 billion pounds in December. Now, obviously, there is a concern about the high levels, but if you look at UK borrowing costs, they're very, very low. So if the government is sensible, and I know that is a very big ask, um, the government could potentially borrow for 30, 40, 50 years if they chose to do, ch chose to do so, very, very low rates, when you can borrow for 10 years at 0.3% on the gilt market, then it stands to reason it might be worth trying to implement some new, very longer term bonds and repay this borrowing over a much longer term time frame and lock in those low yields. So um, that for me, I think, is the, the key takeaway. It's not so much about the levels of borrowing, it's about the cost of borrowing. And I think that's what markets are looking at at the moment. With respect to retail sales, we should see a rebound in December, even though 
we experience yet another lockdown. But let's not forget that at the beginning of December, there was a big surge to the shops. Who can forget those pictures on the news of crowds in Oxford Street, Oxford Circus? And I think part of the reason why we saw such a big spike in coronavirus cases was as a direct result of that modest reopening at the beginning of December. That should be reflected in the retail sales numbers for December. Um, still expecting a rebound there of around about 1%. Sales of electronic items are likely to have been a boost as well because we got a new Xbox X and PlayStation 5 and you couldn't get hold of any of them for love nor money. So you should see, you should see a fairly decent retail sales number for December. So that really, sort of, I think, tells us that, you know, the pound, um, downside on the pound, downside risk on the pound has diminished quite considerably over the course of the past few weeks. And that's really borne out, I think, by um, the way this sterling chart looks here. We have broken a very key downtrend line from the highs that we saw back in 2007, 2008. We're running into a bit of a barrier at 137. And we can see why from this horizontal line that I've drawn across this chart here. We've got a series of lows through February 2018. And we've also got a decent peak here around about September 2017. We're running into a bit of a barrier there, coincides there. But also if we zoom out, we can also see that it's a decent retracement level from the entire down move from 2.11 to 1.14.11. So big, big barrier at 1.37. I still maintain we can see a move back towards 1.40 on the basis that the economic data, if handled, that the economic rebound, if handled correctly, should be fairly sterling supportive, even though we are a little bit overbought in the short to medium term. So what does that mean in terms of downside risk? Well, in terms of downside risk, um, we're, we could potentially fall back to the 50-day moving average here, which currently has been supporting the rebound all the way from the November lows. So, um, if we do get into dips back to around about 134, 135, um, should see a rebound from those sorts of levels. So that's the pound against the dollar. Um, inflation, as I say, not really a market mover at the moment. We've got CPI from not only the UK, but also the European Union. Those numbers aren't really expected to move the dial that much. They're due on the same day as the presidential inauguration on the Wednesday. Expecting a modest uptick to UK inflation in December, um, largely as a result of higher fuel costs. Oil prices went on a bit of a tear during December on the back of that um, Saudi OPEC deal. So that's likely to put a little bit of an upward bias into the monthly inflation numbers. But overall, there's nothing really to scare the horses there. In terms of earnings, we've got Netflix. Netflix results for Q4. Now, if we look at Netflix's chart, we can see that um, it's been struggling over the course of the past few months. It's been broadly trading sideways, but it's fairly solid support in and around $456. And Netflix has been one of the big winners of the pandemic over the course of the last 10 to 12 months, as been shown by the move higher in the share price. But subscriber growth is now starting to slow down. Again, that's not a surprise. Um, the markets didn't like their third quarter numbers when they only managed to add 2.2 um, million subscribers. But let's not forget, they added nearly as many subscribers in the first six months of this year than they did in the whole of 2019. So I think there was it's not unexpected to see a little bit of a slowdown. I think the big thing now is in the context of the new competition that they've got from Disney Plus and the likes of Amazon and, um, and Apple, can they hang on to market share? I think that really is the big question. And I would argue they can because their content slate is so much better than anybody else's. They've got so much more content um, than Apple, than Disney Plus, than Amazon Prime, and it's all in a one-size-fits-all category. Single price subscription, yes, they have put their prices up, but they've still got a whole host of new content coming up down the pipeline. They've got a new series of Stranger Things coming out. They've got season four of The Crown, which is still season three of Star Trek, 
discovery. And I think the continued closure of cinemas into this year is likely to keep those subscriber numbers fairly buoyant with, with, most, with most attention on its international markets. In, in the US, I think Netflix is a saturation point. So it's really about how many more international subscribers it can add going forward. So the return of live sport to TV screens in the third quarter also may have taken an edge of some of the subscriber numbers as well. So for Q4, this is what we're expecting for Netflix. Revenues of $6.57 billion, another 6 million new subscribers. Um, so that is well in excess of the 2.2 million it added in Q3. Um, in terms of momentum, yeah, it could start to struggle, but it's still the market leader by quite some distance. And yes, it does trade at, its prices are higher than everybody else's, but there's a reason for that. It's a much better product. So if if there is any disappointment, we could see a drift back to the 200 day moving average, but the big support is in and around 456, currently from where it is at 457. We've also got Goldman Sachs continuing the bank earnings theme. As, of, as I record this video, I haven't got sight of JP Morgan, Citigroup or Wells Fargo, so I don't know how good or bad they will be, but given that Goldman Sachs does not have a big retail operation, I would be surprised if the Goldman numbers disappointed. The only concern I do have is this move looks well overextended and is well ripe for a pullback going forward. This sort of move is unsustainable in the short to medium term. Look how far it is away from its 200 day moving average. It's, you know, if you can go back an awful long way and whenever the price moves any distance away from the 200 day moving average, you get a corrective kick in. And we are well overdue a correction for Goldman Sachs. It's gone too far, too quickly. And as such, I think even if we get a massive beat on Goldman, I think an awful lot of that is already priced in. We've also got um, numbers from Burberry, um, third quarter numbers on the 20th. We've got Dixon's car phone. Um, we've also got Bank of America as well. So um, th that's it, I think, really. I think. I've covered quite a lot in a very, very, very short space of time. Quickly have a look before I go at gold, because I know a lot of you like for me to look at gold. Um, for me, the 200 day moving average is a fairly key level on gold. So I'll quickly, quickly summarize that. We're still above these lows here. I think we're going to continue to range trade between 1760 and 1960. Um, the 200 day moving average currently is managing to constrain any downside. Every time we've dipped below it over the course of the past year or so, it's been fairly short lived. So we can see that here, we can see that here, and we can see that here. So for me, gold very remains very much a case of buy the dips. Uh, and as for Bitcoin, Bitcoin can only be traded um, or by, on the part of professional retail clients. It's not available for retail simply because FCA regulations forbid it. We are now, we are now no longer um, allowed to supply Bitcoin to ordinary retail clients. It's only professional clients that are allowed to um, make Bitcoin available for. So moving swiftly back to what I was talking about earlier. Um, thank you very much for listening, ladies and gentlemen, once again. Um, I'd like to wish you all a belated happy new year and I will speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thanks very much.